I don't know what it was. He's walking upright like a man. Sightings in and around Vermont. Bigfoot sightings across New England have been reported. Red glowing eyes, about seven feet tall. Red eyes, big old fang claws coming out through, three inches long, you know, just sharp as they could be. There has been another UFO sighting flying over the Royal Botanic Gardens. There are 500 UFO sightings in the world every month. The truth is out there. So we're at 100 episodes, Brandon. Bop, bop, and like, we did 100. Like, this is a real 100 because I went back and actually re- finished the one episode that I skipped that one time. We, the ba- we backfilled the skipped episodes. Yep. We, we finally backfilled that one skipped episode that, uh, well, let's just say reasons. <laughs> it's, but this is the real episode 100. Also, is, if anyone was confused why we went a little bit out of order recently, we were backfilling anything we skipped to have a real 100. Yeah, it was that one episode. We only we only skipped the one, and that was that was the one that was supposed to be Wendigo. Yeah. But got replaced with Chupacabra. The Chup? The Chupa thingy. The Chupa will. thingy. The Warthog. Yes. Um the real so, episode, like, I should have gotten that clue when you tweeted it too, but there's yeah, no reason I, why I should not have gotten that clue. Uh, Brandon, I was actually like not disappointed, but I was surprised. I, I n- <laughs> no, no, disappointed. I was disappointed in you a little bit. Yeah. A little bit. Just a little like not a lot, but a little. Just enough to be like, God damn it, Brandon. You're There's, killing me here. I should have gotten that to the extent in that, like, the people with whom I know today, from back in the day, I met at your house screaming at each other over Halo. Yes. Like, voices yes. were lost. Pretty much everyone, with the exception of one person that I can think of, pretty much everyone that I'm currently friends with was there. Yeah. So... Yeah. Like, that's the day I met sir, people we know. I lost, mm-hmm. we lost, we mutually lost our voices sitting next to each other screaming, get in the warthog, I already am in the warthog. Yeah. 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 It's a thing. It's a thing. And now, but and yeah. Now, and now we're adults. And we talk and about at, monsters on the internet to strangers. Yeah, we're definitely adults. I mean, if anything, I guess you're technically more of an adult than me at this point. That's like, debatable. Under the broadest under the broadest definition, like I mean, you're having a kid, so like having. So like I have like, half a box checked more than you have. Yeah, true, true. <laughs> but like I mean, that box is gonna stay unchecked for me, but that's a whole nother thing. But that's responsibility that I don't want to handle. So, technically, you're more responsible than me. Technically. And we were talking right before this, so what I do want to go into is that I'm merely shifting irresponsibility from Mm -hmm, myself, mm -hmm. right? Because we were talking, and I would do some careless spending on making, like, props for movies, TV shows, and video um, games. Like the fanny pack, too, as well? Oh, yeah, and the... And then... (laughs) How much was that fanny pack that you bought? That's uh, the Balenciaga fanny pack from sex fifth avenue that was a <coughs> grand or so um yeah yeah it, they, if i remember correctly uh they shut down your credit your card after you bought that yeah they because i've never <laughs> shopped at i've never so i do a lot of dumb random spending and usually that's mm-hmm. on like random chemicals and stuff for he's making, on several watch lists i'm on lots of watch lists mostly for making props and guitars mm-hmm. and i mm-hmm. never shop i never bought any fancy clothes in my life before because those chemicals tend to stain them anyway i bought a fancy <laughs> fanny pack once and then the bank was like this clearly can't be brandon this can't be brandon it's it's not dangerous and en- well actually a fanny pack's pretty dangerous but like it's, it's not dangerous enough it's, like chemically <laughs> speaking the last <laughs> The the if I this is if I remember correctly and I think I do, the last purchase I made prior to the fanny pack from Saks Fifth would have been a big old sack of aluminum oxide. Um, wait, 
Sax Fifth sells aluminum oxide? No, no. That's the last thing I use the credit card for. So I oh, got the fanny okay, pack okay. from Sax, but I got a big sack of aluminum oxide, okay. which you, you could either use to make thermite, or I've got some guitars I made behind me, do some cool inlays. It's up to you. Decide, government, which, uh, whatever I mean, one I'm doing. Probably, like, both is, like, both are equally likely for you. Both are equally bit. likely. Yeah, like, like, let's be real, Brandon. Both of those are a possible. Like, neither of those is off the table. I've, I've never made thermite, but I have been around thermite. <laughs> I mean, thermite adjacent, yeah. There thermite was a lot adjacent. of thermite in our high school. I yeah, in like. school, specifically behind the cafeteria. Uh, yeah, like, I remember there being a lot of, ther- like, an upsetting amount of thermite in high school. Which, in, like, retrospect as an adult is, like, what the fuck? Why was there so much thermite? It's, it's so it does make sense. I don't know how much you watched Mythbusters, but about two weeks well, before yeah. that, Mythbus- Mythbusters aired their thermite episode. And then shortly after, the chemistry professor made thermite in class and i think that was a way to try to like connect interests in from like popular media and with the students um now should it have been thermite i'll say no. maybe probably no no but was no, that a can, solid effort yeah because no. i we we still remember it <laughs> but i'm gonna say it was a it's definitely a no yeah definitely like, a no. <laughs> like definitely a no there's like not a question of whether it's a no or not it's Yes, yes, definitely no. Like, the yeah. types of people who were in those classes should not have been, like, even remotely allowed to know about the existence of thermite. I should not know what how to make thermite from high school, nor should I have probably disclosed half the ingredients just now. Thermite's so easy to make, though. It's two things. Yeah. <laughs> it's just two things. Like, like, didn't they, uh, didn't they, like, not say it on... They censored it on Mythbusters. So yeah, I think that's yeah. why um, our professor uh, uh, showed the class is because, like, oh, here's a cool thing that they censored on TV, and I can show these kids, and now they'll have fun with chemical reactions and also don't look directly into the light. <laughs> you might get blinded. You might get blinded. Meow, 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 meow. Yeah, so we're at we're at a hundred episodes, and we're yeah. really good at starting episodes. So bad, we're super professional. We're super professional at this whole thing. Um, God, I can't believe we there. You, if you've listened to every episode of the show, you've like listened to like two hundred plus hours of our voices. Basically, I feel like yeah. I'm well, no, you've curious- listened to a hundred plus, like. Over 150 hours of our voices. Oh, yeah. You've lost days of your life. Mm-hmm. Um, you've you've almost lost a week of your life. Yeah, I'm almost curious to figure out in which order. Like, because we grew from episode one to whatever this is now. And um, I believe there was an improvement, but I'm curious if people started with one and continued. Um, I mean, the numbers say yes. The numbers do say yes, and I will the say there's a lot of uh, yes. there's a lot of fun stuff in the first twenty uh, two episodes with the fake commercials and the number stations. They were decisions that we made. <coughs> they were fun. <laughs> they were decisions. <laughs> I came up with those as, as pitches, and I never contributed anything to any of them. That's I fine. was just pitching. I was like literally just pitching ideas for like things we could do in that like document. And, oh, yeah. like, it wasn't serious, necessarily. It was more like, here's some ideas. Here's some things we might do. And then you fucking ran with them. Well, I ran hard. I own royalty-free music now for those. <laughs> Which is also very funny because well, when Erica plays her video games, it turns out a lot of them use royalty-free music. So I can, oh, she'll yeah. be like, I like the song. And I'll be like, boop, 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 this one. And just play it. She'll be like, yeah. Um... And then there's that one that was, was it the intro to um, Promise Neverland, where I noticed that they stole the, royalty-free the music? fire. Yeah. They, I, I the, found the exact I think was, song they stole with the exact no, audio watermark. 
I it wasn't the whole the, song. It was a component it was, of the song. I thought it was the fire bit that they. Took. It was the like fire the bit. Way, yeah, it was the like literally, literally. They stole fire. the watermark. So, so if people don't know, so when you see like uh, stock photos online and in, you see the watermark like Getty Images across it, when you go to these websites like Pond Five or whatever for music, they have audio watermarks. So, for example, um, if you're listening to a jazz, you'll hear a voice go, on fire, while the song plays, so you can't steal the whole song. So this anime stole just the watermark from the royalty-free music and I put mean, it in their theme. They could have paid for it, technically. They could have paid for it, but then they couldn't get... Once you pay for it, you lose the watermark. So no, no. I mean, they could have like licensed the watermark. You can, you can still license the watermark, technically. This, I don't know. It's a, oh, it's just this fun in between ground. I mean, honestly, I think it falls under fair use for sampling. Yeah, you could also. I would argue it's more artistic to steal the anti piracy thing. Yeah, I, I think I think it falls under our fair use. Well, because that that like that's part of fair use. It's trans. Like it's art- transformative. Yeah, so I think the I think content, t- yeah. I like how we're talking about whether or not uh the Promise Neverland opening song s- taking the fire thing from something is like whether or not that's legal so under like DCMA. Do, do you know why you no longer see the you wouldn't download a car um ads in before movies in theaters? No. They stole that- the music. They stole the music and can no longer show those you wouldn't pirate a car, would you? <laughs> All right, well. That shit's world, true. The world is just purely filled with irony, and, like, I think I might just die now. Yeah. Um. All right, so this is episode 100 of Cryptopedia. If this is where you're starting, Sorry. Um, that's pretty much all I have to say is sorry. Um, <laughs> we're a podcast that talks about, uh, cryptids, the paranormal, things that go bump in the night, um, apparently watermarks and fanny packs, I guess. Things that go um, hump in the night. We do talk about those occasionally, for sure. I mean, we talk about humans, so, like, that's kind of by definition, like... At least, there's at least a few of the people we talk about on this show that go hump in the night. <laughs> yup. By definition. Um, but anywho, I'm John. I'm Brandon. And uh, this week's episode is a big one. I've teased it. I've basically given it away. If you've, if you've read any of the tweets that I've made, uh, I've definitely given it away because there's just so much in this. That I am floored by right now. <laughs> and still floored by. Like, I had an epiphany moment making this episode. And it's one of the worst epiphanies I've ever had. So, uh, without further ado. Brandon, if there were a cryptid that was Cryptopedia's mascot, I think it would yeah. be the Sasquatch. We, like, bo- John, like, John, literally. that is the Cryptopedia mascot. It's in our artwork. Yeah, I mean, like, it's it's pretty much guaranteed to be our mascot. Like, yeah. in addition to being the face of the podcast art, um, a Bigfoot or Sasquatch-like creature has appeared in, like, seven or eight of the 99 episodes of this show. Oh, yeah. And if you're ever thinking, oh, they've got Bigfoot, when are they going to talk about Bigfoot? Now we're talking about Bigfoot. Oh, I've also... We've got... talked... Look. Bigfoot. Squatch some surf. Bigfoot. I just happen to have random Bigfoot why do you, stickers. Why do you have around. random Bigfoot stickers on your desk? Because that I have one's random. Pretty good. That is a pretty good one. Random Bigfoot. I have so many random Bigfoot things. Well, how did you get them? There's P. I just get Bigfoot stickers now. All right. I mean, that happens sometimes. People stuff like just, that just give happens. them to me. Like on Amazing. my keychain, you gave me the thing for my keychain. True. True. I did. I did well, but like I was in, I was in Van, I was on Vancouver Island, so like, like, I'm not gonna not pick up a Bigfoot keychain for you. 
What is is that a mask? It's a Bigfoot mask. God damn it. I, I have baby Yoda masks, but that's a separate thing. <laughs> um I know it's Grogu, but like baby Yoda's baby Yoda. Uh God damn it. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> Brandon has just shown me. Uh I don't know what the first thing was, but it was it was definitely a baby Yoda. It's a, a baby Yoda phone holder. And yeah. I, and I've I've been drinking my water out of the last many, many episodes out of a baby Yoda thermos. Yeah, it's a it's 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 wonderful. It's truly wonderful. Um, but Brandon, those episodes they usually covered purported subspecies and one off events, basically, right? Yes. Um like Battle of Ape Canyon, uh the whatchamacallit, the guy who got kidnapped, uh, Peter Alfred or whatever. Um the uh you know Albert, what I realized? Do you mean Albert Osman? Yeah, that one. Peter Alfred. <laughs> Peter Alfred. Peter Are you Alfred. having a stroke? I might be. Brandon, Don't say I it had again. A, I, Brandon, I have, I have like fallen asleep after 2 a.m. every night this week, and it's not because I was just staying up late. It's because I was working on something. So like I'm in <laughs> I'm in a mood oh. and an emotional state. So like let's just let's just give John a, a little bit of a break when he misremembers Albert Osman's name. Um <laughs> Funny story though, we haven't covered the skunk ape. No, we haven't. Which I didn't realize. That was a surprising one to me. There's a number um, of sub um there's so sub squatches that we haven't there's touched so on. Many, there's so many sub squatches that it's. And I also want to dispel something. Yeti is not a sub squatch. Yeti is a disc- is a discrete thing. It's probably a bear, but that's a whole other thing. Um. Uh, but conspicuously, Brandon, we've never covered the origin of Sasquatch. Not OG Bigfoot, Big Daddy Foot. We have not touched. We I I mentioned it in one episode a long time ago. Um. I think it was the Battle of Eight Canyon, or it might have been the. Uh, we did it Battle of Eight Canyon, foot. Christmas was, Foot, I, White Bigfoot, um, yeah. Orang Pendic. Orang um, Pendic is not Bigfoot, though. Not a Orang Bigfoot. Pendic is just a humanoid. Orang Pendic is different. It's biped a humanoid. thing. Um, but but we never like I only touched on it very briefly. Yowie, maybe. Yowie could potentially be, but I mean that's that's an indigenous. That's a whole other thing. Um. But we also haven't talked about the P- the Peter Gimlin uh Peter Gimlin. Oh my god. The Patterson Gimlin film? The Patterson Gimlin. I read it. I wrote Brandon, Brandon. I wrote this. I don't know <laughs> what is wrong with me. <laughs> you did write Peter Gimlin. I did write right Peter in the Gimlin. Copy. I literally wrote Peter Gimlin. That's why I said Peter Gimlin. Oh. I know that it's Patterson Gimlin. Gimlin. Jesus Christ, what is wrong with me this episode? Uh, I guess because this is episode 100. The Patterson um, Ghibli film? The Patterson Ghibli film? Oh my yeah. god. The food looks so delicious in that movie. It does. I was watching Spirited Away right before we started recording for the first time ever. That's the first time you've watched it? I watched the first hour this morning right before right now. Wow. And um, I don't know if anyone else has came to... I'm sure other people have noticed the same thing, but I think everyone's dead. Because the first scene of that... Uh, no, the second scene of that movie... I'm only an I, hour in, so don't spoil Grant, it. Well, They're dri- but, the dad takes a wrong turn and is like, don't worry, I have four-wheel drive, and floors it through the fucking woods. And then his daughter flies to the back of the car, and the very next scene is them walking through a tunnel to the spirit world. So I think the movie opens with the dad wrapping the family in a car around a tree and their lifeless corpses walk into the spirit world. And that's the movie. I'm not going to say anything, but I, I'm not going to say anything. Um, (laughs) but I thought it would be finally, uh, appropriate to cover the gaps in our reporting on one of my favorite cryptids. Yes. Um, Everyone's favorite cryptid. The A-lister. Oh, uh, Thunderbird's my favorite cryptid, but that's a whole nother what? thing. What? I've literally said this on the show. I have so? gone on record saying Thunderbird <laughs> is my favorite cryptid. Yeah. Like, literally said, I have gone on record saying that it's my favorite cryptid. I just think it's cool. It is a cool bird. Zapdos. Yeah, it is. 
I mean, kind of. It's actually bigger than Zapdos. Zapdos isn't that big. What? The legendary birds aren't that big, if my memory is correct. I didn't know that. I only know them from the from the games. Um, Have I seen Zapdos, Zapdos in the show? Brandon, how tall do you think Zapdos is? Don't look it up. Okay, uh, Zapdos. I'm gonna. I would say on on foot would be my head would be at his back. So I would say six foot tall, twelve ish foot long, and I would say a wingspan of twenty four feet. How heavy do you think it might be? How heavy? He's a bird, so like four pounds. <laughs> Brandon Zapdos is five foot three. What? I mean, Moltres for a bird, is that's six big. seven. Huh. Lugia is actually big. Lugia is 17 feet tall. Lugia. Wow, Lugia. Um, but anywho, uh, this week, Brandon, I'm going to be using two main sources. Uh, All right. The, star- the story behind America's Darling Cryptid. Uh, Abominable Science, Origins of the Yeti, Nessie, and Other Famous Cryptids by Daniel Loxton and Donald Nash. Uh, Daniel Loxton is the one who wrote the se- segment that I'm going to be using things from. And Hunting Monsters, Cryptozoology, and the Reality Behind the Myths by Darren Nash. Um, did I say that twice? I think I might have. Uh, both books have been used as sources in the past, and I consider them to be some of the better reporting on origins of famous cryptids. So, like, if you are interested in any of the famous cryptids, definitely read that. Like, uh, I think I pulled Mokil de Membe's stuff from there. Um, yeah. Tampled. Abominable Science is also on my bo- in my bookshelf right now. Like, definitely it's, it's recommend it. It's a good book. It's a good book. Uh, Nessie's in Abominable Science. Um, it's pretty good. Um, likewise, I'll be pulling a little bit from Lauren Coleman's work. Uh, not because I actually think that anything he says is actually the way things are. Um, but because I want to offer the credulous viewpoint as well. Science! So, yeah. Um, that's not really science. That's that's just... Like, science! Anything you shout is true. Science! Now I'm remembering the song Weird Science and the Fact. So, it's October, right? <laughs> spooky season. It's spooky season. I was like, I'm going to put on a, an October playlist, right? Okay. I didn't make the playlist. Brandon, what name one song that you think is on that playlist. Uh, let's see. Number one, Monster Bash. Uh, number two, um, uh, 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 Lazy Eye by Silver Sun Pickups. Uh... Number three, uh, anything by Rob Zombie. Number four, no, Mambo number five. Literally, literally everything you said is not on that. There's no Rob Zombie on an October playlist. No. It's all Why? Like, it's all stuff that like has ghost in the name or like was in a like uh whatchamacallit? The the jump in the line song from the end. Is there of- anything from the band Ghost? On the October playlist? I don't think there is. Ah. The Monsters theme song was on it, though, and I was pretty stoked about that. Okay, okay, so I'm not... Technically, I'm not wrong, because Rob Zombie is directing the reboot of The Monsters. I mean, that's... Wait, Rob Zombie's directing the reboot of The Monsters? Of course. How, how much How much do you think we're going to see his wife's breasts in that movie? Hopefully a lot. Because, um, like... Because, like, there's huge swaths of uh, House of a Thousand Corpses that are just her dancing with her breasts out. Yeah. If like, I was Rob Zombie, you can't blame Rob Zombie for doing the Rob Zombie thing. Like, so much of that movie. Like, I watched that movie. It's an interesting movie. It's wild. But, like, so much of it is just that. Yeah. You're saying like, it like it's a bad thing. I, I wasn't expecting it when I started watching it. That's the best kind of, of breastuses. Unexpected breastuses? Unexpected breastuses. It just felt weird because, like, she was also... The character itself was, like, insane. So, like, that always adds a weirdness to it for me, but whatever. Um. So, Brandon. Yes. Where do you think the story of Bigfoot began if you weren't looking at this paper? <laughs> If, so I, I make a point to never read ahead, by the way. Okay. Um, and does that 
Is that a question before or after I read your tweet about the thing? Before. Before. All right. I would have expected the and I, Bigfoot I should to... say Sasquatch. I should say Sasquatch because it was Sasquatch before Bigfoot. Okay, so I I would have thought that Bigfoot originated in the American Southwest sometime in the early 1800s is my guess why why the american southwest because that feels more squatchy really yeah like i i thought that like the pacific northwest was like very much like affiliated with bigfoot as like a concept i think that's more strongly tied to bigfoot in my head but i want to say this like mid to southwest is like if i had to pick his origin story like that's the P- where Peter Parker Bigfoot lives. <laughs> that's not where Peter Parker Bigfoot lives, though. That's not where Uncle Ben. That's not where Uncle Ben Bigfoot was killed. No, no, by uh, by Bigfoot Shocker. Yeah, <laughs> by Bigfoot that- Bone Saw. Oh, wait, wait. Uh, was it Shocker? I-, I wait. No, it was uh. Was it Shocker? I can't remember because like I don't recall. They they retconned it in the third Sam Raimi movie to be one of the villains from that movie, and I just don't remember all the villains in that movie. There were so fucking many. Um, <laughs> it's really funny that Topher Grace was uh, Venom. I what Topher Grace was Venom in that movie? He was the he was uh the guy who played Venom. The the uh, what's the name of Venom's symbiote like host? Huh. I don't know. I just know. Oh, gosh. My Eddie nephews Brock. have been. That's all they've been talking about for the last oh month and a half is the new Venom movie. And they finally went and saw it. Oh, God. So hopefully I can not hear about Venom anymore. But that's not going to happen. That's no. not how it works. You should know that by now. Um, all I know is Christmas shopping so much easier now. Mm-hmm. You just buy them a bunch of Venoms. A lot, so many Venoms. Just buy them venom. <laughs> or they're all they're uh, uh, almost uh, puberty. They're so almost... venoms and Sports Illustrateds, <laughs> and we're set. Um. So Brandon, as the norm with so many American cryptids, we must yes. first discuss the legend and lore of those who are here long before Europeans even realized Americans existed. In the case hey, of Bigfoot, we nobody was here before we showed up. Really, completely uninhabited. All right, I feel like that goes against one of the core theses, the core theses of this podcast. Um, the thing that you just said, the, what the things that Europeans discovered the everywhere, the the things that Europeans are the first to exist that everywhere. One. Yeah, that's fair. I've read my history books. History doesn't exist before Europeans show up. That's, I mean, who wrote the books? It has to be true. I mean, I'm pretty sure the Chinese had books before the Europeans did, but... False! Um, So, like many cultures the world over, the indigenous people of the Northwest had legends of ogres and cannibalistic giant humanoids, which stalked humanity. So, just as a reminder, like, the Bible has giants in it. Yep. And they were... I think if my memory was correct, sometimes described as cannibalistic. So like, I think they were cannibalistic. What were they? The, was it the Nephilim? Was that the, um... that, the Nephilim explicitly? Like, yeah, that's a whole nother. Like, okay. So just to remind people, like before you think that it's weird that they thought like a, a group of people thought like had stories about giants and man eating ogres. Remember that like, the religion that a lot of people were raised in has a lot of shit like that in it. There's, yeah, so like you, you, so, so a so lot ex- explicitly Nephilim in the Bible, big giant cannibal things. And then yeah. if you ever watch the History Channel for more than five minutes, you'll find some guy talking about how the Nephilim were real, mm-hmm. and that's how everything is explained. Mm-hmm. Well, that's how the pyramids got made. The Nephilim. Yeah, everything. Everything's Nephilim. It's Nephilim all the way down. Um, we should probably do an episode talking about the Nephilim. Anywho, uh, <laughs> these Market. monsters had bodies covered in stone, utilized talismans, and had very odd weaknesses. So, Brandon, these are three uh, weaknesses that I found in the book. 
Yes. They can't swim. That makes sense if you're covered in stone. I find that reasonable. They can't look up. They're much like dogs. They're they're basically pigs at this point. They're basically pigs. Um, and of course, they can't look at menstruating women. I can't either. I mean, I get that's it. fair. I get it. It's reasonable. It's reasonable. It, it, it's, it's it's all it reasonable. It burns the eyes. The 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 mm-hmm. glow. It's so, the emits such a bright UV light. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Uh, and that's uh, uterus violence. For those of you wondering, <laughs> that is. Um. So Lauren Coleman has the following to say about such tales in Bigfoot, the true story of apes in America, which is false advertising, but whatever. Um, (laughs) The first Americans acknowledged these hairy races, and their tales come down to us in the records of that ethnographers, folklorists, and anthropologists have preserved and overlooked essays on hairy giant legends and myths. Examining these closely, a pattern begins to emerge of Bigfoot revealed. Now, Coleman's take is not entirely unique. Um, many will point to the story of indigenous people that will fit to their own hypothesis, right? But what are the stories that don't? What are the giants that emitted lightning from their fingers? The underwater civilizations in the Sokomish River? Or uh, humanoids with six-foot-long quartz growing out of their big toe? Which... Yes. I'm sorry. So, so the first part of um, that 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 uh, read reminded me of something I saw on one of the Reddit's where someone yeah. was asking that um, should a cryptid be found to be real? Under what category of science would their study fall into? And that kind of made my brain hurt a little bit because, like, what? zoology. Yeah, Zoo- Wait, like they, what? They, what? someone on our cryptozoology asked why, what, where, if a cryptid what? was found to be real, where it would fall inside. It would just be zoology. It would just or straight biology. up be zoology, like biology. Uh, why are people people? Uh, like what? I I feel so upset by that. That statement is upsetting to me. There's and a like, lot of upsetting things in the crypto it, subreddits. It's it's such a like especially our Bitcoin. Um, but it's such a uh... my neighbor. Sorry. So I work with my neighbor, and um, mm-hmm. so he was asking me a, a lot about cryptocurrency and how it worked and what it was about. And then I was like, "Why?" I was like, "You don't even have a cell phone. Like, why? Clearly, you aren't. You don't care about it." Like you wouldn't, not that he, not that he doesn't care about it, but like, it's so art outside of the scope of things that you're gonna deal with. Well, but Why he's are, heard about it on the news. What? I wish, I wish that's what it was. His kid spent his entire life savings <gasps> on buying Bitcoin from a guy somewhere south, <laughs> like thousands of dollars. What? <laughs> and I was like, oh no. So I was like, one, their like cryptocurrency is possibly a legit thing. He his kid spent thousands of dollars on bitcoins. <laughs> but I'd be like, listen, yeah. it's like you're not uh, seeing that you're not seeing that money again. Yes, cryptocurrency no. is real. You can spend it in specific areas, but you're that he's not seeing that again. <laughs> he's not gonna see that again. Oh my god. That's just just gone. That's why you go to an exchange. Jesus Christ. Yeah, um, I didn't I didn't think too deep cuz I I know I'm not asking if I'm start asking about wallets and shit like I know I'm not going to get a straight answer out of them. Yeah. Uh, oh, boy. so now there's um now there's a a teenager <laughs> that lives mere feet away that I have to be like, "All right, so how much did you spend? Do you have a wallet?" <laughs> What's in it? Here, how can we get this back? Amazing. I mean, if if you sent the money, it's gone. It's gone. It's gone. Yeah. yeah. But um, that's also not related to <laughs> to Bigfoot. Nope. Except except that one time Bigfoot did get caught up in a uh, a Ponzi scheme, lost everything. Every did. Back in the nineties, oof, it was a bad time for Bigfoot very bad time the worst of um, times. that's that's why he had to that's why he had to do hair oh wait harry and the hendersons was the 80s yeah 
Yeah. He 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 had to, he it, it happened to him twice. Once in the so 80s, and then he had to do Harry and the Hendersons. It's why he had to keep doing those beef jerky commercials. Mm-hmm. That's also why he's doing the he did the purple commercials as well. Yes. With his wife and his child. Yeah. Yes. Um, he's just not good with money. <laughs> no. Can't no. be trusted. He, he Not only does he have a... Is he good at disappearing himself? He's good at disappearing money. Like, real good at it. So good. Um... But Brandon, it's unlikely that many would use the tales of uh, lightning shooting giants and underwater civilizations uh, as evidence for existence of such creatures. Although I say that, and as I say that, I realize that people have explicitly done that. Yes. So. People okay. have used Atlantis to explain the existence of creatures. Even yeah. though we know the origin of Atlantis. <laughs> we know for a fact that Atlantis was not... Yeah, okay. All right, never mind. I take that back. Well, but Brandon, many of these tales also describe just individuals. Um, okay. Such as the Kwa Kwa Kewak Ogress, uh, Duzu no Kwa, um, who has more in common with Baba Yaga than a whole species of cryptid. Basically, oh, uh, right. Duzu no Kwa was like a baby eater. Okay. For the most part, like, that's, like, it, it literally take Baba Yaga's story and, like, transpose it to the Pacific Northwest, and it's basically yeah. the same concept. Like, I mean, there's definitely differences. There's definitely cultural differences. But, like, if we're talking about the rough, like, structure of the story, the rough structure of, like, what's at the core of the story and why the mm-hmm. story is told the way it is, it's very similar, you know? Um, And, Brandon, much like the Ropin, Mokile Membe, or even Champ, Modern explanations for these stories flatten their context and remove the nuance that made the stories what they were. Now, I'm in no position to express the intent of cultural stories, and I'm certainly not going to accuse them of being based on historical fact. Allegory and symbolism are not a Western creation. They're not? No, no. No? Yeah, like, abstractions of thought through stories, like, is basically being human in human society. Yeah. Like, I, I literally don't have anything else to say. It's it's being a human being. If you can have, if you can tell a story, with telling a story is basically just telling symbolism. There's so much symbolism yeah. just in, in abstract thought and what I'm telling you right now. Some would state that's like, what oral history is. Yeah, so whatever. Yeah. But like, like that's, that's kind of the problem. And we've hit this like with nearly every cryptid is when people take things too seriously. Yeah. People have no ability to detect sarcasm and they have no ability to detect uh symbolism. No, symbolism or just like st- uh metaphoric la- languages like the some for some reason when subtlety one person speaks another language and another person speaks a different one, the idea of like metaphor and symbolism is completely lost and like oh this is literal well yeah i mean that's true like that is a problem with with translation because like it loses the nuance right yeah you can't you literally can't like unless you have the nuance and the context you can't make assumptions about anything like it's usually like it's easier to it's more correct to assume it's allegorical unless somebody explicitly says, no, this really fucking happened. Yeah. Um, but regardless, as a result, the co-opting of native stories to be some kind of spurious proof of cryptids is just another extension of the imperialism that makes the Wendigo a complete no-go for this topic, this podcast. Um, it's a little less egregious in this case. It's pretty egregious. But at the very least, Bigfoot is not a symbol of Western expansion and colonization. So I'm fine continuing the Bigfoot. <laughs> um, but Brandon, I don't have to spend any more time this week in how Bigfoot hunters have co-opted native legends because I'm not going to do it anymore. I just decided I'm not going to do it anymore. Um, <laughs> it's You've decided to not scream into the void. Pretty much. Um, yeah. So, historically speaking, the modern interpretation of the Sasquatch legend begins in the 1920s British Columbia. John W. Burns was a school teacher and a bureaucrat who had collected local legends from the Chalahasis 
Indian Reserve, which is what they were called they called that at the time. Um, and keep him keep his uh, occupation in your head, but don't say anything yet. Okay. Now, allegedly, meaning wild slash hairy man men, the name Sasquatch is Burns' anglicization of a word from the Halko Melm language, which is unsurprisingly believed to be a mispronunciation. <laughs> what? So a mispronunciation? Sasquatch, Never. Sasquatch is likely a mispronunciation that was anglicized by a school teaching bureaucrat. I don't believe um, that for a second. So over the course of three years, Burns gathered tales of the Sasquatch, apparently from eyewitnesses. Now, these eyewitnesses near unilaterally describe the Sasquatch as not monsters, but men. In these stories, Sasquatch was not much different than other indigenous people. They used fire, had clothing, and even lived in villages. In fact, the hairy giant portion of their name was referring to their long hair. Like, they had yeah. hair down to their waist. Yeah. Um, the Sasquatch of Chihalas lore didn't seem to be so much as monsters but another tribal group that can be seen in this speech from a leader. Uh, to all who hear now, some white men have seen Sasquatch. Many Indians have seen Sasquatch and spoke to them. Sasquatch still live all around here, right? So um, if Sasquatch was the Sasquatch that we know today, we would have heard more about Sasquatch is what I'm just going to say, right? Okay. So the original interpretation of Sasquatch from my understanding is completely and utterly different than modern Sasquatch. Like, completely. 100% different. Now, to further cement this notion, Burns reported on a Chihalas woman who had spoken to Sasquatches, lived among them, and had given birth to a baby fathered by a Sasquatch. So, while okay. these stories are hearsay, um, they're from the indigenous people that paint a picture of Sasquatch as more of a group of other people and less yeah. as mystic and monstrous beings. Like, honestly, if you just told me that Sasquatch was the name of a tribe and read everything off to me, I would have been like, yeah, that makes sense. Like, yeah. if I didn't have the context of... If I didn't have the context of what we now view Bigfoot as, like... If, if somebody just read that story to me, I would never make the leap to a cryptid. Yeah, no, that seems almost, um, I don't know if the name of a tribe necessarily, but this tribe's name for a specific group of people living adjacent yeah. to them. Yeah, like, it, like it, it these are be... the Sasquatch people. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like, like these are the Guidos. <laughs> it's it's basically the same concept yeah to me because like it's describing like a cultural combination of people who mm -hmm. have certain trends that they follow and things along those lines now brandon it is possible however and i haven't found anywhere to support these notions but it is possible that the indigenous people um, of the location in which he was gathering these tales we're fucking with him there's not would not be the first or the last time I presume that um we either have <laughs> that we've supposed this or found someone else <laughs> assuming that they're just messing with him so Brandon I want to remind you what his profession was he was a school teacher and a bureaucrat yes. who operated near a reservation, which is an important combination in 1920s Canada. Brandon, James W. Burns was something known as an Indian agent, a white uh -huh. representative who acted as a liaison between the Canadian government and indigenous communities. The position oh. was established in the Indian Act of 1876, which existently, was explicitly designed to erase First Nations cultures and force them to assimilate into Euro-Canadian culture. 
James oh. Burns would have literally been acting as an agent of this legislation, and Brandon, he likely played a part in sending members of that community he gathered the reports from to residential schools. Now, oh, nobody so has he's... reported on his action. Uh, okay, okay, okay. No, I, I follow. Yeah. He's... Huh. Yeah, it gets worse when you consider the fact that he's a school teacher and a bureaucrat, which means he might have been teaching at the residential schools. Yeah. Like, I don't have any evidence to support this. I don't think anyone's looked into it because, like, honestly, like, consciousness of what happened in residential schools is still, like, in its infancy in a lot of, like, Western culture and, like people kind of ignored it for a long time and like we're only now like starting to realize like we're only now realizing things because well white people are only now starting to realize things because white people are slow when it comes to realizing anything about race which is just a fact real slow we're real bad at it like as a group we're terrible at it individual people could be good but the group Oh, there are so many bad. There are so many of us who are bad at it. Um, but Brandon. Oh, so he he is one of presumably a number of people given positions under that legislation that would function. Mm-hmm. Like that's a key position. Uh, of like he. What am I even trying? I don't even know what I'm trying to say. He he is the person that. In his position, the indigenous peoples would have to, like, try to work him in order to uh, advance their position is not the right word. But be he's the person I mean, they need to convince to be less fucked by things. Yes. He's in a, a, a complete position of power over these people. Like, yeah. bar none. Like, there's no, like, there's no other way to put it. He is in a position of power in relation to these people. Right? Like, it's just a statement of fact. Um, There is a power imbalance. There is a power dynamic here that's important to recognize. Um, And there's, like, a weird, strange irony in that in the process of erasing the culture of the Chihalas people, Burns sought to preserve it through stories of the Sasquatch. And when I say preserve it, I do that in as big of air quotes as I possibly can. You're really working those fingers. Like, I'm really working them fingers because, like, the obvious way to preserve a culture would be not to fucking erase it in the first place. But It'd that's a whole other fucking to preser- thing. We have this weird thing where preservation means to, like, you're, you're erasing it, but leaving, like, that shadow on the whiteboard where you'd have to go over it a second time. But, like, you leave a shadow. Yeah, you leave the shadow. That's, that's basically what he's doing. Yeah. Now, however, Burns' preservation attempt, as we said, is a cruel apple cruel application of imperialistic thought steeped in an irony he is unlikely to have recognized. It stands to reason, therefore, Brandon, that the Chihalas could have been messing with James Byrne as an exact act of resilience against a cruel reality. Now, oh, yeah. the actual intent and context of these stories, however, has been lost to time completely. But Brandon, like, and not only that, he they could have been fucking with him, but also the stories that were telling him were not stories of monsters. Like No. Like I want to I wanna like layer this in two ways because like one, this is very much a thing that could have been a thing. Cause like um the only reason I, I think this is because like there isn't an officially recognized like Sasquatch tribe or Sasquatch people, um historically speaking. But, like, that also could be a result of the Indian Act of 1876. And then, like, so, like, there's a part of me that's wondering, like, oh, were they coming up with a fake name, like, a fake tribal name for the sake of fucking with him? But, like, also, they could have been literally telling the truth about a certain group. And, like, but, like, regardless, it's not a monster. They're not describing no. a race of monsters. No matter what their story is, it's not a race of monsters. The origin of Sasquatch is not monstrous in any way, shape, or form. Like, bar- like nothing. Nothing about it 
whatsoever is monstrous. And like, it's the way that it progresses, Brandon, is mind boggling. Is all that's crazy because at, at this point, the 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 oral tr- oral uh, uh, recount from the people at the time is just that they're dudes with long hair, basically, dudes and, and ladies, and, dudes, dudes and, and ladies, D- dudes and ladies. They're they're a people that just grow their hair out, and we know mm-hmm. that in modern day yep. they're just they be groups of people for like. Uh, social, political, or religious regions just grow their hair. Yeah. Like... Yeah, so it's... There's nothing crazy being spoken so far. So, like... Like, let me just say... Already... History of Bigfoot? Not looking great. No. In terms of him, like, having a histor... In terms of Bigfoot having a historical basis in any way, shape, or form, or, like any kind of evidentiary support not great no not great great. um so regardless of the origin burns tellings of these legends were are clearly not the modern bigfoot as we've said like it's not a monster like full stop right and like sasquatch as a term as the in concept didn't gain traction until nearly 30 years later like i looked Hmm. up the engrams on google which is you can look up how often words appear in books. And, like, prior to 1950, there's, like, nothing in terms of Bigfoot. Like, it's, like, I think it's, like, on the order of, like, 300 to 1,000, which, strictly speaking, in terms of references and mentions of the word Sasquatch, not that much. No. Right? Like, um... And, like, it's totally unsurprising because it's a regional, like, bunch of storytelling recorded by an individual who has no real renown prior to the cryptozoological boom of the succeeding half century. So, like, it's, there's, like, it doesn't take off like Nessie. It doesn't take off like Chupacabra, right? When it is, it, it's at its inception point, it doesn't, like, spread like wildfire. It takes a whole three decades to reach the point where it actually starts to do something. And Brandon, if it were not for the town of Harrison Hot Springs, British Columbia, in 1957, Sasquatch would have likely languished in obscurity. And I want to point okay. out that this is close to where he was like doing the original gathering and all that stuff. Okay. Um, of all the information. Before so Before we continue, let me pee. Because we're 52 minutes in. 52. I'm pee, just writing this pee, down. Pee, so pee, 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 pee. We're not even a Die. third of the way done with this. I know. Episode. I was like, damn. I was like, come, come. I, then I saw how far in her. I was like, eh, let's go. Um, I'm going to have. I now have to go to the bathroom too. I'll be right that's back. That's fine. <laughs> that's fine by me. Boom, 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 Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, man, that was bad. My body just decided, hey, guess what? <laughs> oh, one of those? Yeah, it Your was Your body had one to let you know what's going on. <laughs> It, well, like, I was sitting here as you were gone, and, like, I'm reading, like, my emails and, like, yeah. looking at any stuff that I had, like, notifications for. And, like, as I see you come onto the screen, I'm just like, oh, no, I'm never going to finish this episode if I don't go now. <laughs> um, all right, so l- I'm going to start it again from... Uh, <laughs> From the top. All right, so let's see. I'll start We're, it from the uh, top of the. I'll start it from the top of this section, maybe, or. Uh, uh, no, I'll start it from this. I'll start from this paragraph. The. Uh, oh yeah, no, we're good. I got yeah. some really good after the credits, uh, uh stuff. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> I played oh, some no. poop music. <laughs> Regardless of origin, Burns' tellings of these legends are clearly not the modern Bigfoot. Even taken as literal, that iteration of Sasquatch is honestly less monstrous than some confirmed humans I know. For facts. That's fair. Like, I personally know humans who are more monstrous than that Bigfoot version. Um, 
Sasquatch as a term and concept really didn't gain traction until ne nearly 30 years later. And I mentioned this before that there was like a lot of engram data that is like, it, it, it indicates that like before 1950, like Sasquatch as a term is basically like, for all intents and purposes, non-existent. Um, it exists, but like not in a scale that is even remotely like, like, prolific for the 30 years that it represents um now if it weren't for the sake if it weren't for the fact that the town of harrison's hot springs british columbia which is pacific northwest um it's western Cal canada uh in 1957 that's <sighs> it's north of washington i had to google it because uh, bc north yeah, of it, washington it's... It's north of Washington, and if, if they hadn't, in 1957, done something, Sasquatch probably would have languished in obscurity and might have just disappeared, if I'm going to be completely honest. Um, in celebration of the centennial of British, British Columbia, the provincial government put up $600 Canadian dollars, which is about $888 in today's money, um, in funding for towns that could propose a project suitable for the... The celebration. So the government put up less than a grand for the settlement of towns? No, 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 no. Not for the settlement of towns. Like, if you made a project in celebration of the centennial. Oh, God. Then you would receive yeah. $800. Uh, you would receive less than a... You would receive less than $1,000. Yes. Okay. Um, Harrison Hot Springs decided to fund a Sasquatch hunt. Dusting the then anemic local legend off for the celebration. <laughs> That's again just happened not that long ago. <laughs> which which one? I mean, they didn't host a Bigfoot hunt, but you can ob obtain your Bigfoot hunting license from true, true. That was it, Wis not Wisconsin. One of them, North, Middle, there, no East. It's one of them but, states that I always forget. Yeah. Um. Yeah, so so the proposal itself, Brandon, was denied. But it's okay. unlikely, in my opinion, that the town ever thought it would have been a, like a serious proposal. What did happen, Brandon, rather than a bid for a small sum of money, it was a bid for publicity. Word spread to Canada, papers across Canada, placing the town's unique bid on the front page the story then extended past canada as far as india and new zealand as free oh marketing God. for a potential oh. free marketing for a potential tourist destination that like, th i cannot okay what oh, hang on scroll scroll what year is this 1957 this just happened last year by like right nearby exactly that place specifically to bring in tourism. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm mm -hmm. Sasquatch is a real tourism draw. Like bar none. Ugh. Um the resort and restaurant industry of this town boomed in response to this publicity. And Good. It was further bolstered when British Columbia's Centennial Committee offered a $5,000 reward for those who could deliver a Sasquatch. Without kidnapping it, that's that's important. They Without didn't specify. So so it had to be murder. That that's what they mean. You get five grand, but only if it's dead. <laughs> no, no, you had to like it had to willingly come with you. Basically, okay, not so I, they, okay. Because also, Brandon, keep in mind, Sasquatch is not monstrous at this point. Sasquatch is not monstrous. If I learned anything from your um. Uh, William uh, uh, Osman episode. Um, Sasquatch addicted to tobacco. So if you just had a can of snuff, you could lure that so, Sasquatch right to you. So most likely apocryphally, uh, Albert Osman's story is before this point in time. Yeah, but so people I'm would know sure... that you could pay Bigfoot for sex no. with tobacco well, and lure him back to town for five G's. Well, here's the thing, though, Brandon. Like, no, is that's that's not because, like, if my memory cor was correct of the story, he didn't like give a sworn statement for that until years after the fact. Because, you know, 
<laughs> he probably didn't. He probably it probably didn't happen. It probably didn't happen. Um, so Sasquatch hunters emerged who would continue to hunt the creature for the remainder of their lives. Like people who became like lifelong Sasquatch hunters became Sasquatch hunters because of this publicity stunt. Oh, good. And likewise, the first hoaxers emerged on the scene almost instantly. Because of course. Now, yeah, although uh, accidents had foiled their attempt to use plywood footprints to fabricate tracks, people began to believe that the Sasquatch was an actual species of creature and something that John Burns, something that John Burns actually rejected publicly amidst the Sasquatch fever, uh, asserting that they were just large humans of slush descent. So John Burns is like, you guys are fucking idiots. Slush is a, Slush is a, uh, is a tribal group. In British Columbia. Oh, okay. Just for reference. <laughs> I saw you highlight it. <laughs> you saw me copy and paste. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so like John Burns, the person who's like the originator of the story, is like, yeah. shut up, you fucking idiots. It's not a monster. And I kind of, as much as I don't like John Burns as a person, there's something very funny about that to me. So, um, excluding the apocryphal, uh, most likely apocryphal Albert Osman kidnapping case, which was uh, episode 81 of this very podcast. Kitty. Um, <laughs> cats interrupt the podcast a lot. Frequently. Has, has, uh, uh, in the 100 episodes, cats have interrupted quite a bit. Oh, yeah. Um, quite a They're bit. professionals. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So... The first sighting of a Sasquatch by a white person occurred in 1955 when William Rowe saw and reported an encounter an encounter in a sworn statement with a now myth- mythical beast hiking in the Fraser Valley one afternoon. <clears throat> My first impression was of a huge man, about six feet tall, almost three feet wide, and probably weighing between somewhere near 300 pounds. Uh, it was from okay, head- so, so before the three... like. Six foot, uh, three feet wide, about average. That's nothing crazy. 300 pounds is, um, the uh, girthy for that height. Uh, I'm like, so here's the thing I can't imagine ever in my life being able to look at something and guess how much it weighed. No, so I'm just height, over... height, I can do height about, yeah. But but wait, I can't look at someone and be like, I know how heavy you are. There's unless they're the same height as me, I can't I can't guess weight. I can't um, even do that. Six foot three that. feet. That that's about um my height and width, shoulder to shoulder. So three bills is uh that that's if I gained an extra like seventy, eighty pounds. It's a lot. So that yeah, that that's at my current weight. So that that that's uh like it's a, meaty, uh, a meaty thing. A dad bod. Yeah. Well so Bigfoot's got dad bod. Well, we're about to get it. It's not dad bod, it's more mom bod. Uh, um oh, 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 oh. So, Okay, I like this better. It was covered from head Bigfoot to foot. thick. Bigfoot thick though. Um, it was covered from head to foot with dark brown silver tipped hair. But as it came closer, I saw its breasts that uh-huh. it was fe- by its breasts that it was female. The arms were much thicker than a man's arms and longer, reaching almost to its knees. Its oh, feet throw me broader. around. God damn it, Brandon. Are you what are you doing? What are you doing? Why are you sexualizing Sasquatch? Nothing. Well, you're not the first. Gonna but climb. why are you could con- Clown her like a tree. <laughs> I'll show her a disappearing act. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 God, I don't even remember. Um, yeah, I'll bust out that were... tire swing. Oh, no. God damn it. <laughs> its seat were broader proportionally than a man's about five inches wide at the front tapering to much thinner heels sturdy when it walked god damn it when it 
Dirty feet. Mm, step on me. <laughs> when it walked, it placed the heels of its foot down first. Lick them toes. And I could see... Oh, God, Brandon. I am never going to be able to get through this if we keep sexualizing <laughs> Bigfoot. <laughs> um, see the gray-brown skin or hide on the soles of its feet. The chin pr- protruded farther than its nose. Uh, but the hair that covered it, uh, leaving bare only the parts of the face around the mouth, nose, and ears, made it resemble an animal as much as a human. None of this hair, even that on the back of the head, was longer than an inch, and its neck was also inhuman, thicker and shorter than any man's I'd ever seen. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, when Rose saw the creature, it was about 20 feet away, and eating leaves with white, even teeth. Upon scenting Roe, the creature got up, walked away, and looked over its shoulder at Roe as it left the area. Now, Brandon, Roe's Sasquatch is literally the linchpin of the modern conception of the Sasquatch. Like, the way we view Sasquatch right now is literally word for word. It's the same description. This description, this description is literally how we view Sasquatch, right? Like, in no uncertain terms. His description is literally the typifier of all Sasquatch descriptions ever since, and even the supposed mannerisms, the heel foot walking, looking over the shoulders at the witness, which originate, both of those originate in the story. Moreover, previous sightings in the Fraser Valley describe Sasquatch as fundamentally human, with none of the ape-like trappings described by Roe. In no uncertain terms, Brandon, this should be the most research sighting in the history of Sasquatch lore because it literally is the like origin point of the modern conception of Sasquatch. And I've never heard of it before <laughs> at all. Hilariously, that is the case. Like I did mention it once on this podcast, I think maybe in like a breath, but it is super unresearched. And I'm going to get into why it hasn't been researched. That, so, so my present knowledge of Bigfoot is that the Patterson Gimlin film is like the first mm-hmm. ever popular Bigfoot anything. And then from there, moving backwards, the next closest thing is like um, Native American um, paintings of bears. I mean, I wouldn't even consider the Native American paintings of bears to be remotely related to that. That's more of the cultural appreciation bullshit that big yeah. That, well, that, that's what we get. That, yeah. That's again, like going back, like the History Channel. Like, there's the Patterson yeah. Gimlin film, and moving back, they're like, "Of course, Bigfoot's real. It's been here forever. Look at these paintings of bears." And then you go, yeah. "There's the," and then you go, "The indigenous people are saying that's just a bear or bear spirit in their culture." And then we're like, "Nah, dog, that's Bigfoot." Yeah. Because, fuck you. You don't yeah. know what you're talking about. Um, so, but, like, in fact, Brandon, the Patterson-Gimlin film was a decade after this this description <laughs> happened. A full decade. Yeah. So, Sasquatch hunters were aware of this story. Okay? I want to be very clear about this. People interested in Sasquatch, people who researched Sasquatch, people who read about Sasquatch, knew about this story. Okay? This story is effectively, like, if it's true, it's everything, right? If it's false, this story being false basically falsifies the conception of Bigfoot as a modern, to- like, thing. Like, yeah, that's how m- important this story is and probably part of the reason why nobody knows about it. Because if something's wrong with this story, something's wrong with literally every story that follows. All of the things. Because they all match this description. And every story before the story is a human. Except for the apocryphal stories that are different. Um, Yeah. So, William Rowe gave his sworn statement in 1957, alleging the event had occurred two years earlier. There exists no additional interviews with William Rowe. No meaningful supplementary data on his life, nor contemporary collaborations from 1955 that indicate that Roe had seen the creature. John Green, a pro-Bigfoot 
researcher, not the young adult author. Think more, <laughs> think less fault in our stars and more fault in our Nords. Okay. Um, had been the one to reach out to Roe and get the sworn statement via correspondence after hearing about the encounter during the newspaper. The alleged newspaper article has never been found because John Green has no records of this paper that okay. he found this in. Daniel Loxton put it, puts it best. For all its influence, the Roe case is ultimately a story told by an unknown figure for unknown reasons under unknown circumstances. Perfect. Perfect, it's, perfect. It's literally the modern, like, it is the thing that modern Sasquatch, modern Figfoot hinges on. Without this one thing, everything else falls apart. And it's, like, the shakiest story, one of the shakiest stories that I'm going to talk about in this episode. Yeah, the, the foundation is built on sand that questionably exists. Yeah, like, like we assume there, that, like, people assume there's sand there. That's yeah. how it is. Like, it, it's... It, it's like when you build in a like survival game and you build on top of nothing and it's just like hanging out there. Yeah. Or it, it more more specifically, it's like in Valheim when you're building a bu- like a bridge <laughs> and you're like, uh-huh. I think this will hold, and then it crashes. That's basically what this is. Yeah. Um, I also want to point out we literally don't even know what William Rowe looks like. There's no f- surviving photos of him. Even better. All right, so we yeah. should go out like William Ho. William Rowe hunting. I mean, honestly, ba- like, like it would be about the same as Sasquatch hunting. We could go looking for the spirit of William Rowe to fill us in on the original Bigfoot. If that's so, not a sci-fi or, or National Geographic show, I don't know what is. Uh, I think there's a. I think that there is a uh, a documentary called "The Man Who Killed Hitler and Then Killed the Bigfoot." I think it might be in that. I could be wrong. Stalin. The man who killed Hitler was Hitler. But, I mean, yeah. Um, no, it's the name of a movie. Technically. <laughs> yeah. Um, so until this point, the term Bigfoot hadn't been used, even though I've been throwing it around willy-nilly. In fact, the only discussion of foot size occurred in William Rowe's account. On October 5th, 1958, a Northern California newspaper, um, Bigfoot in a Northern California newspaper, Bigfoot was born. In Cryptozoology A to Z, Lauren Coleman introduces Jerry Cruz, the man who encou- whose encounter spawned the now famous monster in the Humboldt Times as follows. Terry Cruz's older brother. I you also know loved times, deodorant. <laughs> do you know how many times I nearly spelt Terry Cruz while writing this? Probably section? so many. So many. So many. I kept thinking it was Terry Cruz as I was like thinking about <laughs> this. Um, and I just like kept getting confused. So The first use of the now widely used label did not occur until a quiet, church-showing construction worker named Jerry Crew appeared at a Northern California newspaper office with a plaster cast of one of many large hominid footprints he had found in the mud in Bluff Creek. Bluff Creek is, like, like... Bluff Creek is where this story takes place in the Patterson Gimlet. It's near where the Patterson Gimlet And it's not foreshadowing at all. Yeah. Um... So, since we started the show 100 episodes ago, my personal estimation of Lauren Coleman has really, really plummeted. Um, yeah. His introduction to Jerry Crew is manipulative as fuck. Like, <laughs> it, it's using a bunch of, like, things to paint him in a positive light. Like, oh, he would never, yeah. never ho- hoax anything or, like, anything be wrong. And, like, no. honestly, Jerry Crew probably wasn't the one who hoaxed it. Uh, because he worked for one of the most prolific Bigfoot ho- hoaxers oh, in history, no. Raymond Wallace. Oh, good. Fantastic. So, um, Jerry Crew uh, had seen some unus- something unusual, some unusual footprints while clearing some brush near a Raymond Wallace-owned construction site in the August of 1958. Crew had assumed it was a prank, particularly one carried out by his boss, Raymond Wallace. Everyone, in fact, believed that it was a prank carried out by Raymond Wallace. Everyone, all of the people 
who were in the crew thought, oh, this is a prank. He's fucking with us. Yeah. The footprints then dried up in the following month, reappearing after Wallace had returned from a business trip. On October 3rd, 1958, Cruz took the plaster cast and brought it to the newspaper, commenting, committing, cementing Bigfoot in the zeitgeist of the 20th century through plaster. Uh, Wallace was immediately suspicious of the community, in the community, with the sheriff's office even asking him to come in and explain the joke. That I is, shit you not. By the way, 63 years and one day before the airing of this very episode. Uh, we'd be, it would be, yeah, 63 years in one day. That's pretty yeah. wild. Yeah. Huh. How about that? How about that? How about, that's, How that's about almost that? perfect. That's almost perfect. <laughs> we're, we're, we're recording a day before the 63 year anniversary of that event. Yeah. Huh. Huh. Okay. Um, Wallace ultimately denied he was responsible, but in 2002, he died. Oh. And Brandon, his family okay. unveiled one of the sets of strap-on wooden feet that he had used for hoaxing Bigfoot tracks. One. <laughs> now, one that one foot, of the many. <laughs> yes, that foot doesn't match the, cruise ca- the crew cast. It does match other tracks that were in and around the same area at the same time. Okay. And I'm now, surprised. Brandon, <laughs> yeah. Brandon, I want to point out, and you should, you probably know this. You can make more than one set of fake feet. Oh, yeah. Like, you can do that. That's possible. Now, you you can make fake feet also from the same methods used to cast footprints mm -hmm. by casting them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Some mm -hmm. would say you could do it really easily and cheaply and quickly. He used plywood, though. He put I a mean, more effort into it. Plywood now is a little bit higher in price, but it's falling. Yeah. But he put a little effort into it. Like, he had to carve it. I mean, um, did they have jigsaws? They had to have jigsaws. <laughs> it's not like he I was mean, out but, there with, like, a handsaw well, well, or but, a jeweler's like, there saw. Is, there is, like, the impression, like, of, of, like, not just flat things. Like, you probably he probably sanded off the edges, is my guess. You could do that Around in a day it. with a chisel. I, be, I I have guitars that I felt. You could do that with a chisel in a day. Okay, okay. Um, I'm regardless. not saying it's not work. I'm just saying it's not a lot of work. No, and especially if it's somebody who had also been exposed as a Bigfoot hoaxer in his lifetime. Yeah. In 1960, he claimed to have captured a Bigfoot, offering to sell the creature, who only ate 100 pound bags of Kellogg's Frosted Flakes. For one million dollars to Bigfoot researchers. Oh boy! Moreover, the corroborating stories came from Wallace's brother, and all of the sightings and experience at the time were reported by Wallace's workers. I'm not <laughs> gonna say that. I'm not gonna say that like it necessarily means that he hoaxed it. I'm just gonna say it's pretty. Uh, there's a lot, there's a preponderance of circumstantial evidence that indicates it's, that he pokes that particular pit, print. And I'm not saying Bigfoot is a serial masturbator, but if we know anything about Kellogg's, the only reason you would give a Bigfoot that much of Kellogg's cereal is to keep him from masturbating all the time. To be, to be fair, it's Frosted Flakes. It, it was John Kellogg's brother. Yeah. That, it was, that's it was after brother. they diverged. They're not, it, that's not the, the, that's not the anti-masturbation one. If anything, that just exacerbates masturbation. That's, it's that sugar rush. Honestly, he might have been, he might have been, uh, harvesting Bigfoot, Bigfoot seed. seed? Oh. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm That's how you grow Bigfoot footprints. That's how you grow Bigfoot, uh. Um. So, despite the fact that there is a strong implication, and when I say strong, I mean, like, it's so, like, close to obviously being the case, like, that it's ridiculous to even consider another reality in this particular one. Because, like, there would be other stories that might be more in more likely. Like, if there were other stories that were more likely, I wouldn't latch onto this one. But, Brandon, yeah. there is a problem. 
do you do um, you say? Yeah. So the ho- the if the basically two Bigfoot researchers, the Bluff Creek tracks are considered canonical and holy, effectively. As okay. John Green notes, the tracks that were discovered in the Bluff Creek drainage in Northern California in the 1950s are not just another set of tracks that can be easily set aside as something tainted by claims of fakery, while other tracks are still presumed to be genuine. They are the base layer of the bedrock on which this whole investigation is founded. More simply, Brandon, if the big if the Bluff Creek tracks are hoaxes, Bigfoot likely doesn't exist as well. Mm. Because this is the first instance of Bigfoot footprints being found. Right? Yeah, we're and in like, an awfully shaky foundation. Yeah. So for this reason, despite acknowledging that Raymond Rollis was a prankster, Lauren Coleman will not concede the fact that the Bluff Creek tracks were his handiwork. Likewise, Raymond Wallace is avoided at all costs in the writings of pro Bigfoot researchers. Examining his role in the event cast a pall over one of the, the, the already shaky pillars of the existence of Bigfoot. In hand-waving the footprints as an axiom of their belief, such researchers can avoid recognizing a structural weakness in the metaphorical house that is the existence of Bigfoot. Now, yeah. Brandon... They can never acknowledge those prints as a fake because that that's the foundation well, that all of modern cryptozoology is based on. So if those are ever in question, everyone's like, like source of income is at risk. Like... Bigfoot, like, so much of, like, so much of the notion of a belief in an actual Bigfoot is, like, based on these two really, really sketchy stories. They are yeah. not compelled. Like, in terms of, like, I can't say, like, obviously because of the way that proving a null hypothesis, like, you can't prove, you can't prove the null hypothesis, right? So, like, I can't prove that it didn't happen, right? Or that Bigfoot doesn't exist. Yeah. But I can say that, like, if we're applying Occam's razor, those two stories are likely fake. Oh, yeah. Or, like, like just... Occam's razor says that, like, oh, they fabricate... Like, the first dude fabricated it for the sake of the publicity... Because of the publicity of everything, and he wanted to get, like... Notar- like you want to get noticed right whether it was yeah. successful or not is another question but like that would be the motivation there yeah the second sighting the, 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 the footprint sightings um that was just a if, if that was fake that's just a dude fucking with people and like we see that time and time and time again it's like one of the most common things in human history people like to fuck with other people it's um i can attest to that it's so yes. much fun. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so much fun. I think there's evidence of that on this very podcast. There is much, much evidence of that happening. <laughs> um, so Brandon, I I think the thing that sets Bigfoot apart, though, and like the reason why these shaky stories, which are really foundational belief, like to the belief of Bigfoot, um are not like mitigated like the, the the shakiness of their their stories is mitigated because of the Patterson film Gimlin film now okay despite the importance of the preceding tales the current form of Bigfoot most can't immediately conjure the image of Bluff Creek tracks nor a full description of Rose Sasquatch like they don't know the story they don't know either of those stories they might know what a plaster cast looks like they might know yeah the modern conception of Bigfoot, but they don't like most people will like, if you say those names to people, they won't know it. But mm-hmm. the events of October 20th, 1970, 67, however, are absolutely seared in the public consciousness as Robert Roger Patterson and Bob Giblin went into the, went to the Bluff Creek in Northern California to film Bigfoot. And I want to point out, they went to film Bigfoot. That's important. That was the okay. reason they went to Bluff Creek. They didn't. They weren't going on a camping trip. They were going to film Bigfoot. Okay. 
So the footage was captured by a handheld 16 millimeter camera and consists of 954 frames lasting 60 seconds, depicting a supposed female Bigfoot walking left to right across a big creek bed, and then there's a cut and the Bigfoot is walking away from the camera. Um, The recording occurred after the two men had been on horseback in the Six Rivers National Forest, rounded a bend seeing a large hair-covered animal next to the creek. Patterson's horse reared and threw him. Somehow, Patterson was able to get back up, retrieve his camera from the bag, and film the creature. Very little, very little footage is as hotly disputed and as analyzed in the history of film, with the, the Zap Bruder film and the moon landing perhaps being the only peers to the Bigfoot uh, like footage. Like, yeah. specific footage. There's events that like people have looked at a bunch of angles from, but like in terms of like strips of film that people have analyzed those are like the holy trinity of strips of film that people have analyzed yeah for conspiracy thought at the very least now while you've likely seen the film before brandon um i do want you to look at watch the let's watch the film again together okay um, so i have a link to i found a copy of the un like cropped version of it um, but uncropped remind... you mean like unstabilized on yeah yeah. Okay. So I'm going to I'm going to post this in our our chat. So it's 57 seconds total. Um Okay. So do, do, do. Um this is this this particular recording comes from a National Geographic thing and I'll have it in the show notes. Um Damn it. I should have copied this into my clipboard before this <laughs> my computer sucks. Uh, boop. Okay. So, um, all right. Well, I, I do want to like remind people there's no audio because it's a 16 yep. millimeter camera. Um, there is no audio on a 16 millimeter camera, or at least the 16 millimeter camera that was being used. Um, there was no way of recording an audio track to the film. Right. Um, so, like, no, like, VHS-style stuff happening here. So, I don't know how long it's been since you saw the footage, Brandon. But, it's like... It's been a while. So, the thing that... I'll le- let it keep playing before I uh, start it over again. Um, the thing I immediately noticed right now is that the the the, the person holding the camera, actually, they're running forward for some mm-hmm. distance pretty quickly. I mm-hmm. want to um, start because at first it just looks like a shaky whatever. But mm-hmm. then if you just no, they're running. Pay attention to the yeah. ground. Someone's sprinting full speed at a Bigfoot. <laughs> mm-hmm. And the Bigfoot is like, I want to point out the Bigfoot is barely moving. Bigfoot don't it give look, a fuck. It looks at him and it walks slowly away. Right. Um, it's actually like much darker than I thought it was. Like a lot of the, yeah. the images that were like are famous in regards to this story are like kind of cleaned up, I think. Um, mm-hmm. So it is much shakier than I remember, but I think that's because most of the reproductions of it are zoomed or stabilized, right? Yeah. And second, the most famous scene begins at the 27 mark 27 second mark and lasts about 10 seconds and then followed by a rarely shown clip of patterson running to where the creature had been right so yeah. like the the jump at the end of it like i have i've only seen that a handful of times it's not even like in my mind when i think of it because i'm thinking about the 10 seconds of the, thir- the 57 seconds not yeah everything else um now i personally don't believe that this footage is authentic I'm yeah. going to get into part of the reasons why I think that. But Daniel Loxton's take is probably the most correct. Okay. No one knows for a fact whether this film is a real Sasquatch or a man in a gorilla suit. And that's that's facts. We literally don't know it's a, if it's a Sasquatch. Even if it is real, we don't have any live or dead Sasquatch to compare it to. Likewise, we don't have the hoaxing tool, nor a confession from either of the potential perpetrators of the hoax. So, like, Occam's Razor says it's probably not a real Bigfoot. 
I'm but. trying to remember. So I think that um, the guy who who uh the guy who who wore and built somebody claims to have worn and built that costume. Yeah. I think his name was like Bob. Some yeah, Bob. There, there is. I'm not. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because I might do a full episode on yeah. On it, the Patterson Gimlin film, Bob um, Hieronymus, I think is a how, yeah, yeah that is, that by is the, the Google. That is the name. Yeah. Um. So I'm not going to go into that because I want to read the book that that comes out in. Um, okay. That's not like so. That might be the case, but like once again, we don't. Oh, I don't know how true that is. Like, it is possible like, that I, something I, this famous somebody could claim for yeah, publicity it, to it, like sell a book or whatever it's one of those things where it's like it's hard to make any real serious calls on this and like not because like oh i think bigfoot might be real it's more yeah. because like if we're operating under the true precepts of of skepticism like i can't say for certain but okay. i can give you a good approximation of why i think it's fake so Brandon, literal books have been written about this film. This 57 seconds. This 954 <laughs> frames. Full oh. books. Careers have been made on this 57 seconds of film. I believe while you were uh, writing this, you texted me that there was a podcast that got how many hours of content out of this 50-second uh, footage? 13 hours, if my if my calculations were right. <laughs> it was like 13 hours of content. And I was just yeah. like, I literally don't know how they got 13 hours out of it. 13 like, hours of 50 seconds. Okay. It's, it's... Like, there's a lot you can talk about It's preposterous. It, but talking about explicitly the film, like, there's not... 13 hours to talk about this film in my opinion but i i also like i don't have a strong desire to do anything about it right because i don't care and yeah. like it's easier to assume that it's not real and just like cuz like if it was real that would be important but like also like the fact that we haven't seen other like Bigfoot in like a real way, in a meaningful way, yeah. like it, it's one of those things that like, if this is the case, there's not a surviving like population, right? There's no. not a way for there to be like a, a population that can survive just given the number of people who live in those types of areas, given the fact that there's satellite footage, the fact that there's, um cities everywhere like <laughs> if 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 we encroach on any kind of wildlife they're going to show up in towns right like yeah it would happen eventually so that's a whole thing um but brandon this film is totally different things to different people even people with the same general beliefs not only skeptics question the authenticity of this film but believers in physical bigfoot do as well and, Brandon, things get more complicated because we uh, the recording speed of the original footage mm -hmm. is completely unknown. We huh. don't know what speed the camera was at at the beginning uh, when this was happening because yeah. the camera that he was using and I'll get into the, I'll, I'll get into to why that's a big why we don't know that in a second. Um, and that's honestly a critical factor in determining the nature of the creature's movements. Because one person says, if this was at 24 frames per second, a human could absolutely do this in terms of yeah. movements. And then other people are like, well, a human couldn't do that, but they're operating under the assumption that it's a different frame rate. Like, I think it was 18 frames per second was that operating. That oh, happens. okay. But, like, that is actually a very fair point. That is a huge, hugely important. Because, like, think about the way that, that, like, kung fu movies are shot. They, they speed up the frame rate to make it look more frenetic or yeah. slow things down, you know, like it's a thing to change the like notion of stuff. So as Loxton notes, the film cannot stand on its own either for or against its authenticity. It's an amorphous blob, a Rorschach test even <clears throat> that can be shaped to fit a narrative. 
In the absence of per perfect authentication of the raw data, the best we can do is examine the circumstances surrounding the film, namely the character of Roger Patterson. So I don't know how much you know about Roger Patterson, um, mm -hmm. but the way that the the way that he's described in *Abominable Science*, like their introduction to him, yeah, is pretty great. So he's they both Rob Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin were cowboys, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and Roger Patterson was described as no angel, a slap cash kind of guy you shouldn't do business with. And he had a used carsman salesman type personality. So, um, and that was from the people who defend him, not hoaxing the film. Like, yeah. people will say that about him, right? And now, given the amorphous qualities of the film's subject, uh, Greg Long decided to instead look at the man behind the camera. A study of Patterson's life, interviewing friends and family members, painted the picture of an artistic hustler with dreams of scoring big, which is kind of relatable. Mm -hmm. um, Patterson's life was characterized by his commitment to show business and doing work from ranging from rodeo work to inventor and Bigfoot sculptor, as well as writer. Moreover, Patterson had been trying to break into Hollywood even before the film had been recorded. Likewise, he was a known fraudster and had ripped off every person he had ever met, including friends and family. So, really, really uh, trustworthy fellow we're dealing with. Now, Patterson's character is shaky at best, but the circumstances around the film also don't really pass a sniff test. Patterson, who had already written about Bigfoot, he had already written about Bigfoot. I don't know how much I can stress this. He had written about Bigfoot before this um and just very important to know that this man was aware of bigfoot yes he went to the six rivers national forest with the once again the express intention to capture bigfoot on film not only did he succeed on his first attempt but he did so with a 16 millimeter camera that only accepted a 100-foot spool of 16-millimeter film. I looked it up. At 16 frames per second, this is only about four minutes of film. Less if being filmed 24 frames per second. Very important. So a quick like, interjection about um, film speed and your human ability to move and all that. Um, yeah. So the difference, the percent change from... Um, 16 to 24 is fi is 50 percent, right? So you're talking about a a delta of half, like mm -hmm. someone's moving basically twice as fast as a human, or exactly the speed of, of a human. That that's the percent change between 16 and well, it's, 24. It's not quite half. It's not quite twice. It's 1.5 times as fast. Yeah. And if we're talking yeah. 18 to 24, then we're talking 33 and a third percent. Yeah. So. So it's it's significant. Like it's ex delta, it's very significant. The delta is very important. Knowing the frame rate something is filmed at is essential. Yeah. Right? Cuz that tells you exactly how fast you should play it back. And now I want to remind people 24 frames per second is like television, cinema, things along those lines. Like Yeah. Traditional film is usually at 24 frames per second. Except The like Hobbit. Actors and stuff like that. What did they do? Was The Hobbit at... at uh, the Hobbit 60? was like something... I forget. Oh, People yeah. They did yeah. some weird shit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I remember that now. Now, since this footage, Brandon, there haven't been any videos of Bigfoot matching the impact of the Patterson-Gimlin film. A fact made more glaring given the thousand of hours of video being produced just for a single Bigfoot hunting episode on shows like Monster Quest. He had four, like, four, maybe 16 minutes tops of footage to film with. Yeah. Modern shows are literally constantly filming. Gigabytes to terabytes of data exist for oh, modern yeah. shows. Like, crazy amounts of data exists looking for Bigfoot. And, like... 
Hundreds of thousands of individual people have hunted Bigfoot with better technology and also failed to capture footage, which comes even close to what had been recorded that day, with better cameras, newer cameras, cameras with better zooms, cameras that have night vision, cameras that could do have better like picture quality. So much stuff, right? To say the least, Patterson had been... One of the luckiest human beings in human history, if the film is in fact authentic. Now, more importantly, Brandon, think yes. back to the story for William Rowe, right? Does the William Rowe story sound a little bit familiar after watching the Patterson Gimlin film again? Just, uh, oh, yes. Because <laughs> it's pretty yeah. much beat for beat, the Patterson Gimlin film. God. Like, and now I'm, I'm recalling beat. the. All every like National Geographic and History Channel breakdown of the Patterson Gimlin, where they're break and they're actually describing Bigfoot's breasts in the videos. Pendulous breasts. They're yeah. <laughs> they're yes, Bigfoot's like, pendulous breasts. Down to the gender, it's the yeah. Same. They're the all motion, identical. The way it walks, the way it looks at the camera, everything is identical to William Rowe's story. The fact that it leaves slowly identical to William Rowe's story. Okay. Yeah. Very important. Um, and even more important than that, Patterson had written a book in 1966 in which he had a drawing of Rowe's encounter in it. And it was basically a uh, storyboard for whether oh, like perfect. Some, someone were to, sh- to shoot it. Yeah. Now again, Brandon, if Rowe's account already on study account is not true, Things really don't look good for the Patterson Gimlin film because it's like beat for beat the Patterson Gimlin film. Yeah. Right? And the Patterson Gimlin film was recorded by a man who was familiar with the story, who already wanted to get involved in show business. Oh, gosh. So, now, as for why Patterson might vehemently deny accusations of the film being faked, he made a buttload of money on the film. Gimlin, who has been far less vocal about the events, however, sold his rights to the film so he had less stake in the continuation of the film being authentic. He rarely made appearances prior to 2005 to to talk about the film, um, although he denied having any hand in hoaxing with Patterson. After 2005, however, he did begin to visit Sasquatch contentions, although this smells like a monetary thing, where it's like, Hey, I've got money on the table. I might as well take it. Right? Like, just even yeah. selling autographs. <clears throat> um, but Brandon, he, regardless, so I let me know. Stop me if you if you cover this in the in the last bit. But if I remember correctly, I believe. Um one, one passed away. His wife now owns the the cop the rights mm-hmm. to the Patterson Gimlin film. Yes. And there's a big legal battle because yeah. as long as like Discovery History Nat Geo keeps showing that film, then the estate will continue to receive residuals off mm-hmm. that film. Yes. And somebody else owns a controlling interest as well and they've split the interest between two people. Because yeah. like I think because basically Gimlin selling his film sold it to someone else and that person gained control like of rights for a certain context and then the Patterson family has control of the rights for certain contexts as well so like yeah. nobody who's actually involved with the original story uh, like confirmed involved with the original filming uh, has any incentive to ever say that it's anything other than true correct yes because if anyone says that it's anything other than true, their money, their cash cow dries up. Yeah. Like, full stop. They no longer have the source of income. Like, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to make the connection of maybe they might be lying for the sake of this. But, like, once again, I can't outright say it's a fake. What we, I can say We can't is, say it's a fake, but we can say... There is a very strong monetary incentive for the people who own the film. For it to, to not be a fake. For it to never come out to be false. 
Correct. So, like, I can't confirm or deny it, but, like, in my heart of hearts, I know that it's, like, I, I consider it fake. Yeah. Um, but, Brandon, like, regardless of what, what, whatever, regardless of whether it's true or false, this film has made an indelible mark on the human consciousness, right? It absolutely haunts the minds of those who seek it, leaving us to ponder on the nature of life in the natural world. For some, this results in acceptance of cryptids in the paranormal. For others, it drives them to explore the natural world scientifically, recognizing even the mundanities of the world belie surprising complexity. If you happen to fall in the former category, you're part of why we started cryptid Cryptopedia three years ago, because it's also our three-year anniversary. And I have no intention of talking down to you or ridiculing your beliefs, but I do hope the past hundred episodes have been a positive experience for you. And, like, a chance to look into Brandon and I's worldview and hear potential explanations that we give to the ph phenomena, like, it might have been interesting at the very least, or may have given you a different perspective. Um, I don't think that there's many people who fall into the belief category who listen to our podcast, just kind of because of the nature of our podcast. But, you know, if you're here, if you're listening, like, I don't hate you because I disagree with you. Like, I want to be clear on that. Just because I disagree with someone doesn't mean I hate them or think they're stupid. Most of the time. <laughs> yeah, I think we just fall in the category of, like, we, we think the recipe is more interesting than the cake. Oh, 100%. I yeah. legitimately think that, like, the rationale behind cryptid stories and, like, paranormal stories and, like, how they form is more important. Because, like... I don't think that everybody is out to get... I don't think everyone's out to, like, hoax everything. I think pe there's genuine belief out there in things. But I also think that sometimes that genuine belief is formed from a misunderstanding of natural phenomena. Which, that natural phenomena is interesting in its own right, and the misunderstanding yeah. is interesting in its own right. And I think that that's the fascinating part. Not necessarily that there was a ghost over there, right? I know that that has a lot of implications, but, like... The, like, the, the opposite of trying to understand and trying to think of alternative explanations to a supernatural reasoning is so rewarding, in a sense, yeah. to me, that I just love, I love it. I, it's super, super important to me. And, like, um, I don't really have much else to say about Bigfoot this episode, because, like, we'll talk about Bigfoot more in the future. Well, we'll definitely talk about more Bigfoot. Um, Bigfoot to me's origin is the weak, one of the weakest, honestly, of cryptids out there. Surprisingly, it's like kind of weak sauce when you take everything as like if you take a look at the the core pillars of the Bigfoot story, it's weak as shit. Um, like there's definitely cryptids who I would be more less surprised existing than Bigfoot. Right, like a lot. Yeah, of them. like Bigfoot's kind of high on my list of things that I think are fake. Um, but like, it's also a very appealing myth, right? Like, there's something kind of magical about the notion of Bigfoot, and like, there's a primal quality to Bigfoot that I think a lot of people really appreciate and think is interesting. Um, I don't, I don't have a full grasp of why Bigfoot is so compelling to people, but it is a compelling thing. And I, I honestly think that a lot of it is the Patterson Gimlin film, like, to be totally honest. I think that's a major part of why it's compelling. Um, but, like, if it was filmed at a different speed or, like, there's so many things that could make it so that, like, it's less compelling. And, like, it's wild to me that that 10 seconds has changed the world so much. 10 seconds of film at uh, 16, that's 160 frames, right? 160 pictures basically changed the world. And that's just wild. Um, but regardless of your stance on the paranormal, uh, thank you for listening for the past three years. And uh, 
hopefully been the right <laughs> amount of weird and not like the awful amount of weird because like yeah. you know we try to walk that line but uh, I don't always I don't always nail that one it's weird it's perpetually weird the weird line I mean I was born weird and I'll be weird for the rest of my life so <laughs> Maybe you were bored with it. Maybe you're John. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Maybe it's John. Yep. <laughs> oh, jeez. Um, that's all I got to say for this episode. Brandon, you got anything you want to say for the episode? Uh, or not well. Thank you for sticking around for a hundred episodes, and I'm with you. Yeah. And that the uh, the 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 way in which things are misconstrued. The, the ghost is less interesting than the way in which the ghost was misconstrued or the way in which the the original folklore and culture around the ghost that actually created it was just that that's cooler than the thing that the, the eggs are cooler than the cake man look at eggs I mean it's the cultural context right yeah it's like the cultural the- context and the misunderstanding of the cultural context is far more interesting than the the scooby-doo episode but, well, even the even the Scooby Doo episode has the cultural context in its own right, right? Yeah. There's there's still there's still trappings around it, and like honestly, the way that we view it is more the Scooby Doo way of viewing at it. To be oh yeah, like looking at it. To be totally honest, because like the Scooby Doo way is not to believe things on its face, right? Unless yeah. you're sag- Shaggy and Scooby, in which case you just get sh- scared shitless every time. But like you know. <sighs> we had to get a Scooby Doo reference in on episode. We 100. had to. Like, like the, the the reasoning behind old man Jenkins Jenkins is cooler than the fucking mask on his face. Yeah, yeah. It was really weird that one time with Danny DeVito, though. It was really weird the time with that Danny was a DeVito. Weird episode. Yeah. Um, I actually watched the the Scooby Doo movie recently, the one made by uh, uh, James Gunn or whatever. Yeah. It was pretty fucking good. Still, it was pretty funny. I it's forgot. It's never Mr. gonna Bean get old. Was in it. I forgot Mr. Bean was in it. The the thing that gets old Rowan is Atkinson? the CGI. Yeah. Rowan Atkinson was in in the Scooby-Doo movie. He was like Mr. Mondavarius, the guy who ran the thing. Um, who, spoiler alert for a movie that's over two decades old at this point, I think. You are uh, not wrong. I watched it recently. Scooby-Doo um, 2002? Yeah, that one. Um... For spoiler, if you haven't seen the movie, Scrappy's uh, there. Yeah, yeah. The well, that's a, that's the spoiler. Is uh, Scrappy pilots a robot version of Mr. Bean for most of the movie, <laughs> and nobody knows until the end. Yeah. In which case, then he becomes Scrappy Rex. I think is the name. Yeah. It's it's a weird movie, but it's it's like it's the kind of weird that Scooby Doo deserves, in my opinion. It is. It's the it kind really of weird a Scooby in the 2000s deserves. They uh, they really did it justice, honestly. Like, there's also a scene... Uh, the episode's done, by the way. Um, there's also a scene... <laughs> there's a scene in the Scooby-Doo movie where, like, smoke is coming out of the mystery machine. And, like, oh, Shaggy yes. and Scooby are making, like food or like crepes or something yeah. like that or something along those lines they're like cooking something and there's smoke coming out of the mystery machine it's like i see what you fuckers did yep but um it was definitely made with a lot of love for the original source material it was um but anywho uh i guess i'll get to the plugs for our hundredth episode um our website is CryptopediaCast.com. Our Instagram is at CryptopediaCast. Our Twitter is also at CryptopediaCast. Our email is CryptopediaCast at gmail.com or us at CryptopediaCast.com. And since this is episode 100, um, we usually thank the Jackalopes, right? Um, yes. But I think I think it might be worth it. I think it might be fine to thank everyone um, who listens to the podcast. Um, Most indeed. Uh, so I'm gonna. Well, first I'm gonna go over the the patrons that I know of, um, and then of course anyone who's in the in the the Discord, you're thanked as well. I just have a list of the patrons up right now, and I don't have a list of the Discord people up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So, Brandon, why don't you thank our jackalopes, and then I'll thank our our other folks. Sure. All right. Well, then, thank you to Clay Sinclair, just did a face reveal, Marty Von Party, Bird Schneider, Jonathan Shepard, and Matthew with a Y Smith. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also the we're gonna I'm gonna just thank some people who I think we've thanked some of them before, but like not all of them. Um, oh, thank you, Patreon, for being a pain in the butt. Uh, Lemwood, thank you. He's, yes, Lemwood Sharp. He's he's the he's the Lumberwoods. He's, yeah, he's him. Um, thank you to your mom. <laughs> uh, My actual mom. Yeah, uh, and then uh, we also have uh, a few people who are no longer patrons, but I also want to thank them. Like, Can't uh, blame Ellie. them. I want to thank Ellie. I want to thank Bet. Uh, oh, Brett yeah, Rapp, who Brett Rapp, who is responsible for the, the Puckwudgie and uh, Bridgewater Triangle episodes. That's a, a major thank you to that. Oh, um, I think we went to school with Brett Rapp. Um did we? Right, right, mop. Yeah, I'll, I'll let you. Uh, I'll fill you in on that secret afterwards. Okay. Huh. Well, thank you. Uh, we thank Monty Von Party. Uh, let's see. Um, I have the now. I have the the Discord up as well. Um, uh, thank you to Ali. Thank you to uh, Bert. Oh, we mentioned Bert Schneider. Uh, yep. Hello, Emma Bones. Llama, thank you. Emu, thank you. Oh, and hello, Zephyr, Emu. Thank you. Um, Scythe Master, Starfish, World. Uh, that guy who likes everything on my... Um, the guy who likes everything on my uh, my Twitter every time I make a post. Evan or whatever your name is. Thank you, too. I think <laughs> you follow the podcast. So heartfelt. Um, I, he has a... like. It's very memorable because he has yeah. a... Uh, whatchamacallit? Um, Kermit the Frog avatar. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I, I remember him every time. Uh, he, it's kind of funny, um, but yeah, thanks everyone. Um, and then I'm sure there's people in the Facebook group. All of but the I, folks. I don't, I don't have a Facebook group open. Um, I really want to thank you for the support. Um, we're we're still a pretty small podcast, but like we're doing better, honestly, than I expected we would. I really didn't think we were going to make it to a hundred episodes. A hundred episodes. I didn't think um, there were a hundred cryptids when we started. I knew there was more than 100 cryptids, but I didn't think we were going to make 100 episodes. Um, but yeah, thanks very much. Um, and Brandon, uh, I guess it's time for your plugs. Sure, Plug you could holes. find me on Instagram at donkey underscore hands. My website is boyerb.com. My email is brandon at cryptopediacast.com. And my Twitter is at crypto brandon. And I'm on Instagram at mu2057. My Twitter is at JF Dunham. My website is johndunnelgames.com, and my email is john at cryptopediacast.com. And I want to point something out. I finally fixed the SSL on our website. I don't know if I mentioned that last time, but I did fix it. <laughs> uh, we got that locked now. Um, mm -hmm. our, inst our, sorry, our art was done by Tom Hill. You could find him on Instagram at Thomas Michael Hill. His website is greatergloryco.com, and his email is Tom Mike Hill at gmail.com all right well here's to a, a hundred of these freaking things uh i'm john i'm brandon and things have been pretty weird <laughs>
the violin. Ta-da! I don't know how to play the violin, but John's not here. So he can't tell. Unless his headset is Bluetooth, but I don't think it is. <sighs> He's taking a big old poop. A big old dookie. What's a poop song even sound like? Is it sad? I think poop can be sad, kinda. Or maybe mysterious? Is it... Like a sad happy? Or is it... A relaxing shit. Just something neutral. Neutral dookie. Who knows? Is it just a... Whatever, whatever kind of doo-doo that is. man is it something with corn corn dookie just the sound of corn in your doo-doo what's uh what's dookie even sound like what is poop even who are you and i What is poop? Is it just a collection of red blood cells? And if so, is poop what really gives us life? Is poop the reason for the universe? Is poop even real? Sometimes I wonder what poopy is. Sometimes you are poop and sometimes poop is you. But sometimes poop doesn't even exist. Sometimes you sit down and it's just a fart. But isn't that just life? Life is just farts when you think it's a poop. And I think we really just need to remember that. Sometimes it's just you. Sometimes it's just the poo. And I think that really just describes us all. He's taking a long one. <laughs>